Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. So we talked in our intro about Eugene Peterson saying the most important part of being a parent is being a person. And so that really carries over into each episode. So David, I want you to say, if we're talking in this episode about being an intentional parent, it also means being an intentional person. So what would you say, besides tacos, helps you be more intentional as a person? I can't use tacos. No, I'm sorry. You're not 100% this time. You should, sure. Well, if that's the biggest thing you can. Mm, I have been requiring myself to, for at least 30 minutes a day, watch or listen to something that makes me laugh. Because I think COVID has been this really heavy time. Felt like all of 2020 was this really heavy year, and I could feel the heaviness of that bearing down on me in the way that I think a lot of people did. And years ago, you're going to remember this, we had a dear friend of ours who has a fascinating background in neuropsychology come and talk with our staff. And she was talking about all these different things that change the brain in small and significant ways. And she shared with us the science behind smiling And that she, before she speaks, when she feels really nervous, sits in her car or goes into a bathroom stall and requires herself to smile for at least 60 seconds, five minutes, if she can push it. And we all laugh (laughs) thinking about how ridiculous any human being would feel doing that. But she shared the science behind that that was mind-blowing, about which feels so in keeping with some things we talked about before of just, you know, actions and then feelings and we do the things we do the loving things and then sometimes have the loving thoughts come after that and i loved the thinking behind that that launched my you need to do something that makes you laugh for at least 30 minutes a day so i found a show or i got to guest on a great podcast that as we talk about intentional parenting i would so recommend any dads listening check out a podcast called dadville by John McLaughlin and Dave Barnes, two hysterical men that I don't think I have ever laughed so hard being a guest on a podcast. And so I've been listening to their interviews as a way of saying, you need to smile and laugh more throughout the day. Which might also be good with our Enneagram numbers. Well, here we go. (laughs) And we'll come back to that because we're going to talk about the Enneagram in a little bit. But that's so funny, David. I love that you walked away from that. That was your takeaway because do you know what my takeaway was that we needed to do? What? Eat avocados. (laughs) That's what I remember her talking about, that there's something in them that helps ward off anxiety. How awesome is that? Smiling, laughing, and avocados. (laughs) Yes, we're just going to weave in Mexican food as much during our whole yes, we are. season as we can. So be more intentional. So I started doing, this is so simple, and it really has made such a difference for me with, in the beginning stages of the pandemic, I think I couldn't sleep, honestly, is what it was very well. And I started waking up. I have this weird internal clock, and I wake up at the same time every day without setting an alarm. I don't necessarily depend on it, but I think I probably could. And for some reason, I started waking up like clockwork 30 minutes before I ever have. And I've loved it. I have kept that practice going. And I don't even necessarily do anything really life-changing in that time necessarily. Sometimes I read something really great. Sometimes I do dumb things like look at my phone. But Regardless, there's something about, you know, I think we talked in our 
episodes around the holidays about having margin in your life, and that has created the tiniest bit of margin that has made such a difference for me. And so it's helped me be more intentional, I think, in all things. I love that. Well, thanks. I'm sleepier at the end of the night, but that's kind of nice, too. (laughs) Helps me sleep. Margin and avocados. Those are great (laughs) reminders for us today. And laughter. Yes. I love that. So there's some ideas as we think about stepping into this being an intentional parent episode today. And as we think more about it, Sissy, I wanted to just kind of break that down and talk about some of the nuts and bolts, the ingredients of being more intentional in the lives of the kids and adolescents we love. And and I would say, I think, beyond laughter avocados and margin, <laughs> I think one of the most important places to start is is really thinking about what is the purpose of parenting. And sometimes when we're teaching, I will ask parents the question of, why did you choose this journey? Like, why did you want to become a parent? And I love I love hearing their answers, but more than anything, I love looking at their faces when I even ask that question, because often it's kind of a deer in the headlights look. It's like, I don't know exactly why, or I haven't thought so much about that. But oftentimes, the answers reflect this sense of what they wanted for their family. Understandably, I hear people say things like, you know, a lot of times moms will say, I remember playing with baby dolls when I was little, and I just always wanted to be a mother. People who say, I grew up in a really loving home, and I wanted to be able to offer that to others, or a lot of parents who say, I didn't grow up in a home that I wanted to duplicate, and I wanted to be able to do some things different in the lives of my kids. But it's more about that. It's more about what I want to do in the lives of my kids rather than thinking a lot about what I think the journey of parenting does in us. And I think that's a really important place to start because the longer... I do this work the more convinced I am that the journey of parenting is more about our growth as people than it is about our kids' growth. I really do. I think it is this context, this relationship that God uses to shape us and transform us and disrupt us and create space for a lot of growth, Good, what I call good growth. And I think we all know that with growth comes growing pains, which Mm. is hard and uncomfortable. But I think it's important to lean into that as we think about being intentional. And Melissa mentioned when she talked about why she even started Daystar, she talked about how Larry Crabb and Dan Allender had been such mentors to her and have to us as well. And years ago, Dan Allender wrote a great book we all love called How Children Raise Parents. And he defined parenting in this way. I I think it's maybe my favorite definition I've ever heard. He said, there is no relationship on earth in which we are called to be more noble and to sacrifice more deeply than with our children. No other arena in life holds us more hostage to hope, more afraid to dream, more defensive about our decisions, and more open to receive help all simultaneously. The intensity and passion of parenting bring the potential not only for our worst, but also for our very best as mm. human beings. And I Will love Will you read that. the whole thing again? Yes, I'd love to. There's no relationship on earth in which we are called to be more noble and to sacrifice more deeply than with our children. No other arena in life holds us more hostage to hope, more afraid to dream, more defensive about our decisions, and more open to receive help all simultaneously. The intensity and passion of parenting bring the potential not only for our worst, but also for our very best as human beings. And you and I have talked so much over the years about one of our favorite parts of this job is the freedom that parents would feel to sit in our offices and tell their version Mm -hmm. of being the worst in some moments and what we hope to, you know, create a lot of safety where they could. And I think about How many parents over the years have told me their version of that definition of parenting? And I think about a dad. (laughs) Years ago, I met this awesome couple, and we live in Nashville, which is known as Music City, and we've had the privilege over the years to meet a lot of folks in the entertainment industry. But in addition to music, we're the proud owners of 
the Predators and the Titans too. Yes, and so we are. get to meet parents and families in that space as well. And I met with a couple and the dad had been traded to the Titans and they had two young children and had come in just to talk about some things. And I remember sitting with this couple and I was struck by, as this man was talking, he used his hands a lot to talk like I do. And as he was using his hands, I remember thinking to myself, you could pick me up with your left hand and throw me across the room if you wanted to. <laughs> like this man was just a beast. He was a lineman. And and I was thinking, goodness gracious, you are an enormous human being, a big presence and a really tender guy too. Mm-hmm. Because while he was talking about his five-year-old son, he just broke down and, and started sobbing. And mm. And he said, I remember him saying, he said, look at me. No one else on the planet has this effect on me. And I remember thinking, I get it. Mm -hmm. I so get it. This man who is paid a lot of money to plow people down on national television (laughs) could be taken down by a five-year-old boy. And I think that's that definition. And I think it's a reflection of just how disruptive and transforming and wonderful and hard this whole journey can be. So. What else do you think is mm. important in terms of being intentional? I love that. What you just said even takes me back to a book I read years ago that was wonderful. If you have girls, I would recommend it. It's called Queen Bees and Wannabes. In every chapter, it had a section called Check Your Baggage. And that has resonated with me because I do think that's a really amazing gift of an intentional practice that you can do with your kids. And it's exactly what you're describing, David. And one of the things you mentioned, you didn't say it exactly this way, was, but kids are going to draw out your stuff like nobody else in your life. And I will never forget a mom that came in. This was, I think, really before we were doing parent consultations very much. And she came in by herself. I'd been seeing her daughter, who was 17, for a couple years. And she came in and she said, Sissy, I'm not here for my daughter. I'm here for myself. And she said, I need to tell you something that happened the other day. We're going to pretend like her daughter's name was Molly. And so she said, I don't think I had put together until recently how... Molly has been pushing my buttons a lot. She said, she's been making me crazy. She just has this way of getting under my skin and needling me and poking at me in this demanding way. And she said, I never had made the connection how similar Molly is to my mother. She said, I had kind of a hard relationship with my mother. And the other day we were in the car and she said, Molly started doing it. She was just picking at me and picking at me and picking at me. And I I could tell internally I was losing it. And she said, I turned to her and I said, mother, I mean, Molly. (laughs) And she said, that was the moment the light bulb went off. And I thought, this is not even about Molly. This is about my own relationship with my mother. Mm. And that's part of what's going to happen in this season because you love these little people so much and you're with them so much and you're seeing you are the safest people in their lives and so you're going to get the worst they have to offer and it's often going to bring out the worst in you. And so we would absolutely say, check your baggage. Be aware of what's rising up in you in different moments. And there's one piece of that that we would add that David and I both feel like over the years, counseling all these kids that we have counseled, thousands of kids, and Melissa would say this too, if she were sitting here, actually, she'd be more gracious and generous than we would be, but we would say that we believe that every family, every parent has one child that pushes their buttons more than any of the others. And it's often the oldest child of your same gender or it's the one who's most like you, because there's something about them that feels like an extension of you that you're not even aware of, but you're often trying to prevent them from making some of the same mistakes that you made. And so it's easy to try and squash different things that pop up in them, or that it just makes you crazy. And so with those kids, especially you want to check your baggage. You want to be aware of something arising in you that may not be about them. So that's one of the biggest things I would say in terms of being intentional. And there are a lot of things you can do. We'll circle back around to what you can do if that seems to be happening with that child. Yeah, I'm so glad you talked about that. Well, I think even in it, 
I wish we could sit with you. And actually, not only could we sit with you, but we could sit with 500 other people because we do that often at parenting seminars. That's one of the things we'll say. And I always wish the people were turned and faced each other instead of us, because I think 80% of the room, at least maybe 90% of the room, nods or elbows each other like, yep, (laughs) absolutely. So you're not alone in that. Again, there is grace in it. And we're going to come back to an intentional practice that maybe can help. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Did you know that Minnow has an award-winning children's Bible? Written by VeggieTales creator Phil Vischer, the Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible for Kids is more than a children's Bible storybook. It's a deep, engaging, and whimsical gospel experience. Each Bible story is vividly illustrated, takes just minutes to read, and includes a family connection to encourage readers to learn, talk, and pray together. Find out more at shop.gomeno.com. That's shop.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. I think the sequence of events is important to note right now. That is, we're talking around this idea of being more intentional, that where we started was thinking about what's the purpose of this anyway, the real purpose, and then thinking about what's our contribution as parents. Check your baggage. Then and only then would we move toward thinking more about our kids. And I think that's important to note because so often we sit with parents who are like, I read this book and we've been trying this practice and it's not working, or I feel like there's something going wrong here. And all or most all of the attention given is toward what's happening with their kids rather than what's happening inside of them, which is why I love that you stopped off in that place and where I think it's so important. Or going back to that first idea that, you know, even thinking about that kid, you know, believing God gave me that kid because he's growing something in me. And to see it from that perspective, I think can change the game. And it's no longer all the attentions about what's wrong with you, what am I doing wrong, but it's about this could be everything that's right, but also hard. And so that leads us into the third idea of what we call becoming a student, becoming a student of the kids we love. And we believe in that in in two different ways in particular, studying development and studying temperament. And if you were to go back and listen to one of our seasons of this podcast is what we call the ages and stages, where we break down in different moments, what's happening uniquely with boys, what's happening uniquely with girls, what do they need from the grownups in their lives. And so we just camp out in different spaces with kids in the toddler window, elementary window, middle school and high school, and look at the unique things that God designed to happen in that moment. I think it's a reflection of the wisdom of I love the passage in Psalm, Psalm 139, where it talks about we were knit together in the secret place. And all the intentionality of our God that He designed these things to be happening in the earliest moments of our development. And that continues all throughout, that there are unique things happening in different moments. And our job is just to lean into that more and study what those things are. And again, what do our kids need from us in response to that? So I think that's one of the ways we become a student. And I think secondly, it's studying temperament. And, you know, that reminds me of that passage in Proverbs, Proverbs 22, 6, it says, you know, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. And we tend to, I think, often give most or all of our attention to the latter part of that verse, what I call the money back guarantee part of that (laughs) verse. And I think we miss some of the wisdom of the beginning of that verse of training a child in the way he should go. And One of the things we love getting to do sitting with parents all the time, too, is talk about the fascinating differences, you know, that Mm -hmm. within one family, you can pour the same genetic ingredients in and the outcome be so profoundly different and how often we see that be the case with families. And what does it look like to really study the way this kid should go and the way this kid should go and, you know, praying, God, give me a vision of the way this unique child who may be my button pusher in this family, (laughs) who may be the one who's most like me, praying with that in mind. But I don't think we can do that fully until we've really studied temperament in that way. So let's talk about more intentional practices in light of these ideas. 
Can I throw out one yes. to start with? We mentioned, Sissy mentioned the Enneagram mm-hmm. a little bit earlier, and we believe strongly in that tool. If you've not yet had a, an opportunity, maybe you've just heard of it but haven't really studied that yet, we couldn't recommend it enough. We use it a lot in our practice. We think it's a game changer in families in terms of understanding yourself, understanding your spouse, understanding yourself in relationship to your kids. It just is a really valuable tool. And if you are wondering where to even start, we recommend a great book called The Road Back to You that was written by Ian Morgan Cron and Suzanne Stabile. And they break down the nine numbers and there's a quiz at the end of every chapter to help you figure out which number you are. And and discovering, as Sissy was talking about with that second idea of checking your baggage, you know, what are my strengths? What are my struggles? And mm. every Number has both. There's not a number out there that only has strengths and only has struggles. And your job is just to figure out what those things are. And and again, not to labor too long in this space, but just it's been amazing to me the kind of insight and awareness that I've seen parents build out of leaning into the wisdom of the Enneagram. And I think it's part of the wisdom of, I love Matthew 5 and the way that Eugene Peterson translated in the message, he said, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Let me say that again. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. And I think this tool is such an amazing tool for seeing all of how you see the world, for beginning to put some of those things right in a remarkable way. So we couldn't recommend it enough. Would you we say couldn't. anything else about it? Well, I, I would add our friend Annie Downs has a great podcast where she spends, I think she calls them her Ennea Summers, where she talks a lot about it. Any other podcasts you'd recommend? I they love talk about Suzanne it? Stabile's work. I yes. think the Enneagram Journey is a great podcast Me and too. have learned so much from listening to that. Yes. And I think if I had to say what I loved the most about the Enneagram, just in a bird's eye view, I think it has helped me give myself more grace and give others more grace, which both of those things as a one are huge. I just have loved it for that purpose. And we use it so much in counseling, kids and families. You know, one of the things that I think I love the most about the Enneagram is I think it is, for me personally, and I've heard a lot of parents say this, one of the most valuable tools I've engaged in terms of spiritual formation, because so much of the Enneagram is helping you figure out the lens that you see all of life, how you see your relationship with God, how you see your relationship with others, and what are the things that get in the way. And I have seen that tool for me, and I think you would say the same thing, Sissy, for so many other people as a tool that has brought them into closer, deeper relationship with God and with others. So yes, that's a great one. And then a second one would be in light of the whole check your baggage idea. I think every one of you listening needs a sounding board. You need one person that is really safe, that you trust, that you feel comfortable telling on yourself, that has a voice that would say, you know what? I think that is more about you than it is about them. Whether that's your spouse, whether it's a close friend, whether it's your own parent who knows you really well, any place you need to go. But I think every one of you, we talk so much about the importance of kids having other voices, safe and trusted voices speaking into their lives, but you need them too, as parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles or teachers. I mean, it happens for us as counselors that we have kids who push our buttons and we do the same with each other sometimes. And so we all need other voices, those of us who are in the lives of kids. What else would you say? I'm going to build on yours because I think there is such wisdom in having at least one parent in your life who's a decade ahead of you, one trusted voice who can help you parent with a long view It's so easy to be stuck in the moment if you're parenting a toddler right now and experiencing just the physical exhaustion of that stage of development, or if you're parenting a teenager right now and and so much of your relationship feels defined by the emotional exhaustion of that stretch of development too. I think it's so important that you don't define all of life 
around that particular moment. I had a mom in my office not long ago, and she's parenting a 14-year-old boy, and we could do an entire episode on 14-year-old boys. There's a (laughs) lot to say. And she was talking about a particular frustration with him, and she said, he is never going to, and I held up a timeout sign with my hands, and I said, okay, hold on, pause right there. Whatever you're about to say, I'm not going to let you say, and here's why. I don't want you to say it because it's not going to always be true. Like it feels true right now, but I don't know about you, but I don't want to go down in history as who I was as a 14-year-old boy. Well, I was never a 14-year-old boy, but I don't want to go down in history as who I was as a 14-year-old girl, for sure, yes. No, no one who knew me as a 14-year-old boy would have said, give that guy a microphone and let him talk about parenting, (laughs) (laughs) ever, Yes, because I wasn't done developing, and that was not just true for me, it was true for this young man this mom was talking about. And and we need someone who's at least a decade ahead who can allow us to see things we can't see in that moment that we need to see that I think are a part of helping us be intentional in parenting with a long view. So just talking about these ideas makes me so excited for this season and, and that we can really break down a lot of ideas with you all in ways that we sure hope are helpful and useful and that each episode we're going to have, as I said, Melissa anchor us to some great truth, which we're going to do right now. Oh, we so want to root ourselves in the truth, the truth that stands alone, that will stand forever the truth, the Word of God. Today, our truth is from Matthew 11, 28 through 30, and it's from the message. Jesus says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me. Get away with me. That sounds good, doesn't it? Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. This part I want you to really listen to. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. There is a rhythm. There's a rhythm of living. There's a rhythm being an intentional parent. And it's not just your rhythm, but it's God's rhythm of grace. Your beat, B-E-A-T, may change. And you may even lose the rhythm. But His grace, the rhythm of grace, never changes. I love to snow ski. There's a rhythm to snow skiing. Every once in a while, I've experienced it, having a steady rhythm as I go down the mountain until I see a mogul or a black diamond instead of a green sign and fear sets in. And then I'm tight. I lose my rhythm. I'm out of control. And I'm now a very intense skier. And my intention is to get down the mountain. So I attack the mountain. Thank goodness a ski instructor told me two things that helped change my skiing style. The first thing he said was, when you lose your rhythm, just stop and start again. My natural instinct is to keep going, to try harder, to focus on all the obstacles so that I'm just so focused on them, I go right toward them. As a parent, I think you probably do something very similar because you're going to lose your rhythm. There are going to be obstacles. You become intense and tight and start to even have an edge. But be intentional and stop. Fear starts to control us. Stop and recognize that you are out of control, that it's going to happen. And remember, as a parent, the rhythm of grace. I do feel like the ski instructor had some great wisdom for me, and it's something so unnatural just to stop and not try harder. And I would say to you all as parents, as you so much want to get it right, remember that scripture where he is saying, learn the unforced rhythm of grace. Learn it, because it's not going to come natural. And then right above that in the scripture, he says, watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. My instructor said two things about skiing. He said, stop, and then he said, watch me. And I would add that Jesus said so many times, follow me. So as a parent, 
I want to say to you, be intentional and learn to stop when you lose your rhythm of parenting. Stop and watch. It's okay to start again. You'll do that over and over and over again. The truth that he gives us is you will learn. You'll learn a rhythm and it will bring much more enjoyment, much more than having to fight the mountain. The rhythm of grace that's for us all. I love hearing Melissa's voice right there because I think she is one of these people for both of us, a sounding board, a trusted sounding board. Yes. And and I think as we are talking about those things, both of us talking about having people in your life, I do want to say if you're in a place where you feel like, I don't honestly have anybody right now that feels like a safe person that I can go to, that's why counselors exist. Yes. And there are plenty of parents who I think for whatever reason— can't tell on themselves to anybody else. And so they come and meet with us. Wherever you are, there are people in your community and you can find them through your church, through your school, through your pediatrician. There are people that you can reach out to that can be a sounding board for you and that can be somebody who can help you along the way. And in a different way, we sure feel like that's what we're getting to do with you guys. And we're just always so grateful to be in that place in your lives and on this journey with you. We'll see you next time. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents' trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.